like to share with you folks today is a demonstration of, uh, of applying a, a linear external fixator apparatus onto one of the most common uh, fractures that we see in veterinary medicine, a uh, radius ulna fracture. Uh, what we're going to specifically demonstrate is a type 1A construct and uh, we'll go ahead and throw on an additional plane and make it a type 1B construct. Uh, the goal of this uh, procedure and this demonstration is to, uh, to show you specifically uh, the logistics of putting this together and, uh, make, and make some, uh, some points about specific things that uh, you should keep in mind as you're placing these in your own clinic. And so what we have here is, uh, is a mid-diaphyseal uh, radial fracture, radius ulna fracture. And uh, we're going to go ahead and repair this with, uh, with a linear external fixator. Um, we're going to start with a type 1A and uh, consider transitioning to a type 1B if we feel like the, uh, the rigidity that we're going to get with that uh, additional application uh, is warranted. And so um, what, uh, what we need to assess initially uh, is basically the, the extent of the radius because when we're applying a linear external fixator, we like to, uh, to do it in a near far, uh, far near manner. Uh, I should say far near, near far manner. And, uh, and so what we like to do is go ahead and place our most, um, our most distant pins first. Um, so in order to do that, we need to establish where the proximal joint is and where the distal joint is. And so we've got our elbow down here and we've got our carpus up here. And uh, a really handy way to figure out where that joint is is to use what we call feeler needles. Basically just get yourself some needles and go ahead and see if you can delineate where that actual joint space is, and then you'll know it gives you a much better frame of reference to go ahead and place your first pins. So, let's see, for the radius, probably be easiest to come on over here. So we've got epicondyle right here, so we know that's gonna be the humerus. So just distal of that. There we go and we're in the joint right there. So we know that our proximal extent of our radius is gonna be located right in this general area. Same situation. And so we've identified the carpal joint right there, the radiocarpal joint. And so um, now we know basically the entire length of our radius. And so some of the important things that we need to keep in mind as we're uh, putting this fracture back together with a linear fixator is that we're reestablishing not only the alignment, which again um, is the advantage of doing the hanging limb prep, um, but also length. And, uh, and that's another thing that the hanging limb prep can help you with too, especially with uh, fractures that are a little bit more chronic. Uh, you can get some, some muscle contracture and uh, can be a little bit daunting to, to get that limb length reestablished. And so the nice part about this is you've got a continuous source of tension pulling those muscles apart and helping to get your limb length back together again. Um, another way that we can, uh, can assess that is by having the other limb prepped and uh, being able to monitor that length and compare it to this one if we're, uh, if we're concerned about it in a common unit fracture, for example. The goal you know, with the linear fixator is to try to avoid as much soft tissue as possible with that pin placement. And uh, that's one reason why the radius uh, is such a good, uh, a good bone site to, uh, to place a linear fixator. Uh, because we have a couple of different windows here where there's very little soft tissue. And so um, certainly being aware of where the neurovascular structures are um, and knowing where your most, uh, your most uh, superficial locations are is, uh, is going to be beneficial to avoid that soft tissue. Um, and so generally speaking, um, there's a couple of planes that we can approach this in. And we either go craniolateral or craniomedial if we're doing a type 1A. If we opt to do a type 1B, then we just place the, uh, the other plane um, basically just on the opposite side. And so we'll go ahead and start here on the craniomedial aspect. And so we know, again, that our joint is here. So if we go ahead and just make a releasing incision here, make sure we make those releasing incisions, you know, better a little bit too long than a little bit too short. It, uh, it can get in your way as you're drilling the holes and they end up healing just fine uh, post-operatively. And so making them again a little bit too long as opposed to too short is, is certainly something uh, to keep in mind. So we've got our, our distal releasing incision here. And uh, one of the things that we can use is a Gelpie retractor. Uh, go ahead and place that in that releasing incision. 
And what that does is that makes a nice opening for us to get a good look right down on the bone. And if you look closely, there's, there's such minimal soft tissue down here distally that that releasing incision was basically right through the skin and, and there we are right on the bone right here. And so you know, this is one of those areas that you don't necessarily need a drill sleeve, um, but uh, you know, certainly if, uh, if you want to go ahead and use it, go ahead and use it. Um, and so we've got uh, our drill sleeve here, and uh, what we can do is by pre-placing it on our connecting rod, uh, it gives us a handle, and it basically allows us to go ahead and get it on there, position it, and then go ahead and get our drill in there. And so we'll go ahead and do that. Now, one of the important things to do when you're placing these pins is to go ahead and pre-drill your hole. Um, we really try to stay away from going ahead and inserting the fixator pins in there directly without a hole in advance. Um, tends to cause a fair bit of osteonecrosis and can certainly contribute to uh, premature pin loosening in these cases. And so the drill bit that we use is either the same size as the pin that we're using or, uh, or just a tad smaller. And so what I can do now is I've got my handle here, I've got my drill, and so I've got the ability to go ahead and assess where I'm at and make sure that I'm drilling this pin in there basically parallel with that joint, okay? And so we've got our carpus here. Remember, we got our feeler needle in the carpus there. So I got a general idea where it is. And that joint, of course, is going in this plane. And so I can adjust it up and down. And right here looks about parallel to it, all right? We know our radius is right here. And we can go ahead and Get that, uh, get that hole started. And so, again, cranio, we want to aim at it. And remember, the, the radius is kind of jelly bean shaped. And so what we try to do is aim, again, craniomedial or craniolateral. And again, we're putting this linear fixator on the craniomedial aspect here. And so I'm just going to angle, basically, in this general direction. And that will put us in the, the craniomedial plane, OK? All right, and that was us breaching the, the uh, transcortex. And so we know we're through. And you can go ahead and palpate, double check, and make sure. There we are. And so we'll go ahead and back her on out. We've got our drill hole. And so uh, we're ready to go ahead and insert our... Uh, our fixation pin here. Now, one thing that, uh, of course, we, uh, we don't want to forget is that these holes shouldn't be, and the pin shouldn't be, m much more than 25% of the bone diameter. And of course, that was something that we had assessed when we were, when we were placing our initial uh, our drill hole there and decided the size pins that we were using. We want to try to insert this at a pretty low speed. Um, and you can use either a power drill like I am, or you could use a Jacob hand chuck. Um, both work just fine. And uh, the Jacob hand chuck certainly gives you a little bit more tact uh, tactile feel for where that hole is. And, uh, and so uh, it certainly is, uh, is a nice, uh, nice choice in addition to this. One of the things I'm going to try to do here is get my finger on the opposite side so that I can feel when that <laughs> So I can feel when that pin starts to exit the opposite cortex because I don't want too much sneaking out into the soft tissues. And, and I can actually palpate it right now. And so we're going to go ahead and stop right there with this pin. And we can go ahead and remove our gelpies now. There you go. All righty, so we've got our, our distal pin engaged. And so uh, the next place we want to go ahead and, uh, and place a pin is, uh, again, at our proximal, our most proximal extent here. And so, again, we've got our joint delineated right here. That's basically telling us where our elbow is. And so um, we know where our radius is, and that's just going to be distal to that site. And so we'll get it over here. 
again in the same plane because we're creating a type one construct here um, and we want to get these pins relatively in the same alignment here on that craniomedial aspect. Uh, approximately there's quite a bit more soft tissues and so um, it's, uh, it's quite important to go ahead and make yourself um, a, a large releasing incision so that you can bluntly dissect through those soft tissues down to the bone and have a good view of things and uh, in addition to that it will help you avoid um, getting your drill engaged into those soft tissues. We've got our skin incision and next we'll grab either some hemostats or you could grab some metzenbaums. Um, either would do just fine. And we'll go ahead and just develop this plane between the muscle bellies here till we're down on the bone. There we go. And usually you'll feel your, your instrument hit up against that bone once you've got that plane. And sometimes what you can do is actually place your hemostats in there or whatever device you're using get that pre-placed in there and use that actually as your retractor to go ahead and, and get your, uh, your bone exposed uh, so that you can place your, uh, your initial uh, drill hole. Um, what, uh, what I'm going to do is place a, a pair of gelpies again. Here we are. If you can see, we're looking right down on the bone there. And so that's quite important that we're not drilling through any soft tissues and we got a nice, uh, a nice portal into, uh, so we got our drill bit right on that bone. This is a, a very good area to use the drill sleeve um, in case you do have any soft tissues that are in your way there. Um, it'll help you navigate around them. And so what I like to do is get my drill bit in there, bring my drill sleeve down and then make sure that I'm actually that I've actually got my drill bit right on the bone and if I don't I can come out and then go ahead and you know reposition it reangulate it and uh, when I'm on the bone that's when I can start to consider in what direction I'm going to drill in and so again cranium medial is the plane that we're, we're aiming for here I've got my distal pin sight here and so I'm going to want to try to have it angled in about the same direction Okay, drill sleeve is down, whoop. drill sleeve is down against the bone. There we are. And we can go ahead and begin drilling. And this can be one of those sites, especially in a smaller dog, where you might slip off that bone uh, because there is a curvature to it. Um, and uh, if that happens, you just go ahead and get your, uh, get your drill bit repositioned and, uh, and, uh, and try again. All right, and we are through the opposite cortex. We can go ahead and get our drill bit on out of there. Remove our drill sleeve. Now, one of the things you can do, certainly if you got an extra pair of hands giving you a hand, is uh, keep your drill sleeve located right where you'd place that drill hole. And what that will do is it basically gives you your plane. And so what you can do is have your assistant then hand you that pin and that way you've got a pretty darn good alignment and idea where you need to go. Um, if, uh, if you're doing it on your own, of course, um, it's going to be a situation where you just need to, uh, to get your pin in there. Again, follow the same alignment that you used to place that initial drill hole and try to get that pin engaged into that drill hole. And we can go ahead and start drilling again at a low speed. And you can hear that pin engaging. All right. And I can feel that pin side again because there's not so much soft tissue here on the radius coming right out that opposite cortex. So we don't want to go any, any further than we have to to have that pin engaged into both cortices. We'll go ahead and take our drill off. 
And then we've got our, uh, our most uh, proximal and our most distal pin side. Next thing that we do is we get our connecting, uh, our connecting rod and uh, of course make sure that a connecting rod is of appropriate length. And so really the, the optimal connecting rod is the one that basically allows you to get your most proximal and distal pins engaged into the clamps. And so this, uh, this connecting rod right here is, is a suitable fit. Going much larger than that, uh, we try to avoid that just adds extra, um, extra snag on the apparatus that the, that the dog might have to deal with, and, uh, and uh, it's just unnecessary. And so what we do next is go ahead and get our pins engaged into the clamps, and we've already gone ahead and applied clamps onto this connecting rod in advance, and uh, that just helps facilitate things once we're placing our, uh, our central pins. All right, there we go. Okay. And uh, it looks like we've got about equal length uh, connecting rod going off either end there. And so a um, couple of important things to keep in mind as we're uh, establishing this initial uh, positioning here is for one, uh, the placement relative to the animal's leg. And the reason we don't want to keep that in mind is, is, for, is, is twofold, really. Uh, for one, we don't want it too close because we're going to expect some post-operative swelling and uh, it can create uh, pressure necrosis if you have that hunkered right up there against the skin. So we certainly want to avoid that. And usually a good rule of thumb is about five millimeters to a centimeter off of the skin there to allow some room for that swelling and also to allow you to place some gauze or other absorbent material around those pin sites post-operatively, because there will be some drainage coming from these releasing incisions for the first few days. Uh, in addition to that, we also don't want it too far out either. And the reason for that is it basically makes your construct less rigid, okay? And so there is a, a bit of a sweet spot with this. And so again, not too far out, but not too far in. And so right about there is, uh, seems to be an appropriate position to me. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and hold that there and we'll get the initial clamps engaged. And, uh, and then we have our other clamps there. We can place our next, uh, our next uh, pins. And I usually don't snug these down too tight at this point in case we have to make any ad additional adjustments. But enough so that it's not slipping around on you too much. So uh, we've got our initial placement here, and uh, one of the concerns about this fracture is, uh, is our alignment, and uh, specifically, um, we're a little bit concerned about our, our positioning of our distal and, uh, and proximal uh, fracture fragments. And so uh, it, uh, it is appropriate in those situations where um, you're not too sure about those things to make a mini approach over that fracture site. And so, again, this is a mid-diaphyseal fracture, and so what we can do is just make a mini approach there. Doesn't need to be anything too aggressive. Right over that fracture side. You know, the, the, the beauty of the external fixator is, uh, is that it really, uh, really is a, a, a great example of the open but do not touch approach. And so we don't want to lose sight of that as we're uh, doing this mini approach. And so what we can do is just go in there, take a look at our fracture fragments. And if we need to do any adjustment, for example, uh, if we need to, uh, to get, a, a, say, a freer elevator in there to lever uh, one of the fragments off of the other to get the positioning and the reduction improved, uh, this would be an appropriate uh, time to do that. This here looks good to me right now. Double check it before we go ahead and engage our next pins. The other advantage to this is it tells me basically exactly where my fracture is at because my next pins are basically going to be pretty close to that and so that helps establish our, our next pin locations. You could take a, a again a feeler needle and if you want you can go ahead and position that right adjacent or, or right close to that fracture gap and so that will help keep uh, keep that in perspective. The optimal uh, placement of the next uh, the next pins is going to be again, uh, just adjacent to the fracture site. Now, we don't want it too close. Uh, we don't want it too close because we don't want it going into the fracture. 
Um, and we also want to be careful and cognizant of the possibility that there could be fissure in adjacent to that fracture site. And so a general rule of thumb is uh, about a centimeter or so uh, just, uh, just off of that fracture site. And we'll go ahead and make a releasing incision there, about a centimeter distal to that fracture site. And we've got, uh, got some hemostats here. We can go ahead and again develop our soft tissue plane. And we got a great, great view of that bone right there. And so uh, we are, uh, we're in good position to now place the, uh, the next drill hole. And you can see the, the bone right underneath there. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna not use a tissue sleeve this time. And uh, that's because uh, my tissue's out of the way. I can see my bone and uh, I know and confident that, uh, that this drill bit isn't going to engage the soft tissues. All right, and so I've got my drill placed through that clamp, and this clamp is gonna have the ability to move up and down, of course, and again, in different planes. Now, our plane is already established, and so once we get our level appropriate, You can fasten it down just a bit to keep that position preserved. Of course, you don't want it fastening down too much because it'll just bind your drill bit. And then the rest is done for you because you've already, again, got your plane established. And that was us exiting through the opposite cortex, making sure I'm getting all the way through there. All right, and we're through the opposite side, so we can go ahead and back out. Next step is uh, go ahead and place our, uh, our fixation pin. And this is something you can again do through the clamp. Now, if you didn't pre-place the clamps, that's all right. The nice, uh, the nice aspect of uh, this system is that uh, you can go ahead and uh, disassemble those clamps and put them on later if you need to, uh, or if you had forgotten to, uh, to do it prior. We'll go ahead and get our pin into that clamp. Again, we want it pretty loose. I don't want it getting bound up in there. And we'll go ahead again at, at a low velocity and get that fixation pin engaged. And if you've gone too far, and that might happen sometimes, you can back it out. Now, what backing it out does is it, it does reduce the pullout strength a little bit. Uh, but uh, if that's at the expense of the animal's comfort, then it's, it's worthwhile to go ahead and do that, especially if it's, it's sticking out quite prominently and, and certainly if it's touching against that skin. All right. And again, just like we did with our other clamps, we can go ahead and get that tightened down a little bit. I'm not gonna engage this too tight yet until we get our last, uh, last pin in. And then we'll go ahead and show you how we, uh, we use the two wrenches together to counter torque those clamps to get them nice and snug. All right, let's get our gelpies out. Get myself uh, some forceps here. All right, there we are. Okie dokie, so again, we've got our mini approach here. Now, if you're done assessing that mini approach, now wouldn't be a bad time to close it. Um, if you wanna keep that portal open so that you can reassess things once you get that last pin in, that's certainly fine too. Um, as you're getting these pins placed, realize that uh, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to get that site closed and you're certainly not gonna wanna leave that open if that was a surgical incision that you made there. So um, I'll go ahead and leave it open for now. Again, we'll place our, our, our feeler needle right there and, uh, and we'll go ahead and make another releasing incision, which might be part of the initial uh, mini approach that we did there. 
and we can do a partial closure just to uh, just distal that side. So I'm just going to extend this a little bit. All right, there we are. And now we're looking right at the bone there. Now, I suppose this is a good time to mention the, the positioning of the clamps and how you choose to place them, especially if you're doing pre-placement. And so um, to optimize the stability and the rigidity of your construct, um, it's, uh, it's preferable to go ahead and have your clamps placed adjacent to the, uh, to the bone. Um, having the clamp positioned in this manner basically places your fixation point further away from the axial uh, orientation of that bone, and so it we weakens the, uh, the rigidity of your construct. So um, try to keep that in mind if you're pre-placing these and, uh, and as you're getting your fixator uh, finalized and, and tightened up. We can go ahead and use the drill sleeve here. We got a little bit more soft tissue there. Again, snug it down just a little bit. And the beauty of it is you snug it down like that, you can hold it in a position while you, uh, while you pick up your drill. That clamp's moving around on you a little bit. You can just take your uh, your wrench and go ahead and engage that that bolt and just snug that down a little bit, and that will make sure that that clamp isn't moving around on you. And that's the secondary bolt that you're tightening there. Of course, if you were to do that to the primary bolt, what that'll do is that will go ahead and apply compression at that uh, at that hole right there and actually crush the drill sleeve. And certainly, you don't want to do that. So, um, no need to actually do any tightening with that or, or much tightening, that could be just finger. Um, again, apply just the, uh, the tightening to that secondary bolt. Uh, we'll go ahead and get our, get our drill. Place it into our drill sleeve, which is again right up against the bone. Make sure that we're happy with our alignment and then go ahead and drill. and we've uh, engaged the opposite cortex. We'll go ahead and get our drill bit on out of there. Remove our drill sleeve, or again, keep that in place while your assistant hands you your fixation pin. And then what, what your assistant could do is go ahead and remove that drill sleeve. We might need to go ahead and loosen that site there a little bit, loosen the primary bolt. And again, that just helps to, to keep your alignment uh, and your orientation straight there. And so I'm engaging that drill hole, and so we'll go ahead and, uh, and place our pin. All right, and we've engaged the opposite cortex, so we can stop there. And there we have our... Uh, our type 1A construct, that's the type 1A linear external fixator right there. Again, applied in the cranium medial plane. And uh, for, for, for a lot of smaller dogs, uh, that, that would be um, a pretty good repair. Um, we tried to place uh, three pins in the distal and proximal fragment. Um, and this, since this is a larger dog, what we're actually gonna do is uh, go ahead and turn this into a type 1B. Um, what I'll do prior to doing that is go ahead and, and snug things down make sure that I'm happy with my reduction and my alignment, and then we can go ahead and uh, carry on with that, uh, that additional uh, construct. Now, the primary bolt, you wanna make sure that you're counter-torquing it when you're tightening it down. And, uh, and so, when you're engaging it, make sure you're applying equal forces in opposite directions. And once you have that nice and, and sturdy in there, you, uh, you've got your clamp well engaged and you know that your pin clamp interface is not, uh, not gonna be a weak site. And we go ahead and do that at each of these locations. And there we have it. All right. 
what we'll do is we'll go ahead and remove our, uh, our feeler needles. And we can always replace those if we need to. And uh, now would be an appropriate time to, uh, to assess uh, and make sure that your limb length is good and your alignment is good. Now we had done that mini approach and so uh, the hope is that uh, with that mini approach we, uh, we would be able to go ahead and reestablish that, especially if it is a simple fracture. Now if it's common uta, that might be a different story. And so uh, one of the things we do is kind of take a step back from it and uh, look at our distal and our proximal joint and, uh, and basically uh, see how our alignment is. Um, one of the ways that we can do that while keeping the hanging limb intact is by actually raising the patient's table. So that, what that does is it basically removes the tension uh, that was being applied through our hanging limb and, uh, and it allows me actually to get a little bit of joint, uh, joint motion here and some flexion at the, uh, at the carpus and the elbow. And so one of the things I want to make sure is that this is in proper alignment. And so in that plane, as I flex that carpus, and flex that elbow, I'm quite pleased with the, uh, with the alignment there. And so if you're not happy with it, if for example you have um, a, a situation where your alignment is uh, rotationally um, um, uh, abnormal, you can go ahead and, uh, and fix that at this time and uh, it would be an appropriate time to do that. Um, one way to do that, of course, is gonna be uh, to, to go ahead and loosen your clamps and to reposition the limb as, uh, as needed, and then tightening the clamps while, uh, while keeping it intact. Um, but this looks good, so we're gonna go ahead and keep things as they are, and uh, go ahead and drop the table back down and, and resume that tension at that fracture site. Now would be a fine time to reduce, or go ahead and close that, uh, that mini approach that we've done, um, if, uh, if you're uh, going ahead and proceeding on with either the, uh, the additional uh, construct on the opposite side or, um, or if you decide that you're happy with your linear fixator as is. Um, what, uh, we'll just go ahead and uh, start our placement here in the craniolateral plane. And uh, what that will do is make us, uh, again, a type 1B construct. And uh, that's gonna be uh, basically biplanar. Uh, and so uh, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and plan our construct right here in this general plane on the craniolateral aspect of this animal's anabrachium. And so uh, what I'd like to do is go ahead and start by making my releasing incision. Um, what, uh, what the advantage I have in that initial construct uh, already applied is that uh, I know where my joints are and so I don't necessarily need to use those feeler needles but uh, use them if, uh, if you have any, uh, any concern. Uh, and uh, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and uh, we'll make our initial releasing incision on this side. Uh, what I don't wanna do is have those pins at all close to my pins on the opposite side. And so I'll make my releasing incision in an area where I'm at least uh, five millimeters to, uh, to a centimeter uh, away from those other pins if I can be. And in this situation, I can. And so we'll go ahead and make our releasing incision. And again, bigger is better than, than too small because this area has a fair bit of soft tissue and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're developing that plane right on down to the bone. And that will allow us to develop that plane in between the muscle bellies and get down to the bone. And I can actually feel now contact with the bone. Make sure we open those up and that way we've got a nice portal down into that bone. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and use my drill sleeve. Uh, I'll keep my hemostats in there to keep that, uh, that tissue out of the way. And uh, then I can place that drill sleeve right up against that bone, keep that soft tissue out of, uh, out of the way of that drill, and, uh, and then go ahead and uh, angle it and, uh, and start my initial, uh, my initial drilling. All right, and uh, just like the other side, we've got our, our clamp on, on there pre-placed with our drill sleeve engaging. And so, again, with my hemostats open there, I'll get my drill sleeve placed right up against that bone. And at that point, I can go ahead and remove those hemostats because I know now that my soft tissue's out of the way and that, uh, that drill bit will be protected with that drill sleeve. All right, 
And so now, you know, take a step back and go ahead and assess the alignment of that drill and make sure that you're happy with the plane. Again, we're aiming for a craniolateral plane. And so what I'm going to do is just inch off the bone there a little bit until I'm happy with my orientation. And that feels good to me. I know that my drill is not going to engage this opposite pin, okay? And, uh, and I'm also happy with that craniolateral plane that I'm establishing uh, with this pin. And so we'll go ahead and, uh, and fire our drill hole. And we've exited the opposite cortex. We'll go ahead and back out. And I'm going to keep that drill sleeve in position. And then go ahead and get your, uh, your pin loaded up. And what I'd like to do at this point is get that pin applied in there and that general orientation. Now, of course, removing that drill sleeve out of there, you could have your tissues locked up. And so uh, at this point, what I like to do is go ahead and get my hemostats back in there and just clear those soft tissues off of that thread. And that way, when I'm placing that pin, I'm not, uh, I'm not taking any of those soft tissues with me. And I can see that I'm engaged in that drill hole and that no soft tissues are uh, contacting the threads. And so we can go ahead and, uh, and place our, uh, our pin. Once the, uh, the threads have engaged most of the bone, you don't need to worry about the soft tissues as much. And I can feel on the opposite side, the, uh, the pin coming out the opposite cortex a small amount. And so uh, we can go ahead and stop right there. The next thing that uh, we need to do, as before, is go ahead and plan our, our distal pin site on this, uh, on this plane. And so uh, again, you'll need to make a releasing incision for this. And uh, we can palpate our radius right here. And so what I'll do is I'll make my approach right there between these two pins. Okay. Go ahead and get your hemostats. and bluntly develop your plane down to the bone. And you can go ahead and engage gelpies again if you'd like, or if there's minimal soft tissue covering, uh, you can go ahead and just uh, place your drill bit right against it or again, use your drill sleeve. And there we have it, and you can see the bone right there. And uh, we've got our releasing incision, we've got our gelpies in there retracting those soft tissues, and so we can proceed with, with drilling. And again, if your soft tissues are out of the way sufficiently enough, and uh, you know that drilling, uh, drilling that bone tunnel is not gonna catch them, uh, you don't necessarily need that drill sleeve, and so, I'm gonna go ahead and get my drill right up against the bone, engage it a little bit, and then step back and reassess my alignment. And right now I can see that I'm right in line with that, uh, that proximal pin. And just check here, make sure I'm heading parallel to the joint again, and that looks good. And so I can go ahead and if I feel like I'm slipping off of one side of the bone, and that's one thing I like to do is generally just walk that drill bit off of the front of that bone and the back of that bone to get a general sense of the width of it so that when I'm drilling my tunnel, I'm drilling right through the center. And so right in that general area is, is about the center. And so we'll go ahead and begin our drilling.
All right, and we've exited the opposite cortex. Now, in some situations, it might be valuable for you to know the, the, uh, the diameter or the depth of that bone tunnel. And so if you happen to have a depth gauge around, you can certainly use that. Um, but a neat little trick that uh, you can certainly use and not too costly is to actually just uh, take one of those feeler needles that you were using before to identify the, uh, the, uh, the joint spaces, put a little crook in the end of it. You can use a needle driver if you'd like. Uh, go ahead and put a little bend in it. Doesn't need to be anything. In fact, you don't want to bend it too much, otherwise you'll get it caught up and not be able to engage that bone tunnel. And so just something that once you get through to the opposite side, you'll, you can hook onto the cortex. And so that should be good there. All right, we've get, got our bone tunnel right here. And so we've got our little, uh, our little depth gauge here fashioned out of a hypodermic needle. Smaller needle is going to be better just to make sure you're not getting caught up in that medullary bone. And there we go. I'm through the opposite side. And then I can just hook my needle up against that opposite cortex. And I know now that, that the end of my needle is right up against that bone. And then what you're going to want to do is either take your finger or take some hemostats or, or any other instrument for that matter. Go ahead and get that placed right up against where that needle is entering and go ahead and extract it. And that right there is going to be a pretty good estimate of the depth of your bone tunnel. And that might be valuable, for example, if you're trying to assess whether or not the pin you're using has a sufficient enough uh, length of thread in order to engage the entire, uh, the entire uh, cortex. And so uh, that would work right there and actually be quite a, quite a nice fit. So we'll go ahead and load that, uh, that fixation pin up. And we've engaged the bone tunnel right there. Again, making sure that we're following our alignment and begin drilling. And we're through the opposite cortex, and we can go ahead and disengage our drill. Okay, we've got both of our clamps pre-placed on those, on those pins. Loosening the secondary bolt, and we've got our connecting bar engaged into both of those clamps now, and so we can go ahead, make sure distance was is good and start to snug down those those bolts with our fingers and again making sure that we're not too close to the skin but we're not too far from it either uh, we can go ahead and uh, apply initial uh, attention on those bolts and get them tightened down and uh, take a step back and assess our uh, our type 1b construct And uh, we're, we are happy with that positioning there, so we're just going to go ahead and uh, tighten up those bolts, uh, make sure they're nice and snug, and, uh, and that, uh, that will pretty much uh, be all we'll need to do for that, uh, that additional plane. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is, do we need to be adding additional fixation? Um, optimally, we try to have uh, three pins engaging the distal and proximal fragments uh, when we're applying these fixators, and, uh, and you can see we have that uh, with these two planes. If this were a longer leg, a bigger dog, or, uh, or a situation where this animal's fracture score put him in a position where you thought he needed to have a more rigid construct, then uh, it would be absolutely uh, fine to place additional pins either in these locations or potentially off the ends of this rod if we had a longer one. For this animal and, uh, and the fracture that uh, we're currently dealing with, this construct should be plenty, uh, plenty sturdy and plenty rigid uh, to get this animal through to healing. And so we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and call that uh, appropriate for this, uh, for this particular fracture. Um, and so at this point, uh, I just like to go ahead and get a general overview of things and, and just make sure that I'm happy with things and then do one last final tightening of those, those volts to make sure that uh, we're ready to go to radiology and that we'll be ready to bandage this animal um, once, we're, uh, once we're happy and uh, review our radiographs. We'll go ahead and raise the table back up and uh, remove the tension of the hanging limb prep. And uh, what that's gonna do is, again, allow us to assess our alignment. Uh, but in addition to that, 
uh, that is a good, uh, a good technique for assessing your releasing incisions and the adequacy of, uh, of, of the length of those incisions. And so go ahead and take that limb and place it through flexion and extension because what you'll see is in certain positions that skin could be taut, for example, like that. And so where that pin, if that pin is pushing and deforming that skin, it's, it's just best to go ahead and make yourself a slightly longer incision to reduce any complications related to pressure necrosis from those pin sites. And so you can see now, when I flex and extend, that skin is no longer being deformed by those pin sites. And so the expectation would be uh, that we're not going to have uh, the uh, pin tract morbidity that we would otherwise have if that skin was being deformed and, uh, and had pressure on it from the pins. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got a site where the releasing incision is large, uh, you can certainly place a skin suture if you'd like or a buried suture. Um, you know, and uh, of course, if you do that, that is fine, uh, but just make sure that you're not placing a suture that's causing any tension. And so after that, um, we can go ahead and then proceed on over to radiology and evaluate the, uh, the, uh, the reduction of our, uh, our fracture site. We've gone ahead and we're just going to go ahead and assume that uh, our radiographs were, uh, were satisfactory. And uh, one last note that uh, I wanted to, to, to go ahead and mention is uh, what do we do once, uh, once we've evaluated our radiographs and, uh, and are looking at, uh, at our construct like this? Well, these pins certainly don't need to be sticking out like that. And so get yourself some bolt cutters and trim those pins right on down adjacent to the clamps. Okay, and that will uh, remove some of that uh, some of that extraneous material that uh, does not need to be there and can get the animal caught up into things. In addition to that, uh, again, expect that there's going to be some discharge from those releasing incisions. That uh, is certainly uh, something that we know is going to happen, and uh, and one of the things that we do about that in order to contain it and treat it appropriately is for the first two or three days or so. We can go ahead and uh, different, uh, different folks use different things, but uh, gauze is, uh, is commonly used and we'll go ahead and apply that up to the, uh, the pin skin interface there and that will not only reduce swelling that's occurring at that site, uh, but it will also serve as a, a means to absorb that discharge, okay? And so I'll just demonstrate around these pin sites. Um, of course, you want to have it placed around each of those. Um, some other folks use... Uh, uh, basically old, uh, old surgeon scrub brushes that, uh, that have been cleaned and uh, those also serve as a nice, uh, a nice little packing material as well, uh, given that uh, they're very absorbent. Of course, if you were uh, planning on taking radiographs or were worried about radiographs, uh, don't use any radiopaque gauze. That, uh, that will certainly muddy things up for you. Um, and so once we've got... Uh, our gauze placed around those pin skin sites, um, we can then proceed on with, uh, with a pretty standard bandage. Um, and so typically what I'll do is, and again, imagine that these, these, uh, these pins are trimmed down to nothing. Uh, we'll go ahead and place uh, cast padding around the limb, uh, gauze roll, and uh, lastly, a protective layer of vet wrap to, uh, to keep all of that contained. And that is an appropriate bandage for these animals for the first uh, two, three days. <coughs> when that uh, discharge is expected to be at, uh, at, the, at its most significant. Uh, once that discharge has gone down to, uh, to minimal, uh, you can transfer on over to what we call a bumper bandage, which uh, doesn't nearly involve uh, as much stuff. And uh, basically the bumper bandage, all that is, is uh, vet wrap and some people will use gauze roll as well. And that just serves as a, just a protective, uh, protective covering over that, uh, over that construct so the animal isn't getting it caught in anything. The nice part about that bumper bandage is uh, it allows clients at home to go ahead and evaluate the uh, pin skin sites and make sure that they're healthy and, of course, uh, keeping it clean for those first few days uh, when the animal first gets home. Mm -hmm.